The church in Galatia was born out of a beautiful movement of the Holy Spirit. The powerful and potent preaching of the good news of Jesus birthed a movement among the Galatians. But shortly after the Apostle Paul left, the church was hit with a crisis. The church had been infiltrated by a poisonous and convincing idea. Faith in Jesus was not enough. Instead of resting upon the completed work of Jesus, the Galatians began to believe they needed to affiliate with the right tribe of Christians, which meant they had to add to the equation. It was Jesus plus fulfilling the law, Jesus plus religious affiliation, Jesus plus sacred traditions. And if we're not careful, we too can heretically add to the gospel in the name of our own theological tribalism. But adding to the gospel only subtracts from it being the good news. There is only one equation we need. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Morning, Rice City Church. Good morning, Russell. Morning. <laughs> Yes, they let me come back, and here I am. Good to see you all this morning. I'm hoping my iPad works this morning because it stopped scrolling. There we go. We're in business. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Russell Woods. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and uh, I'm the pastor of young adults and community life. Any young adults in the house today? My, my, my plants every time. Um, we are going through the series, uh, a series on the book of Galatians, but before we get started, I just want to uh, address the elephant in the room. There's been a lot of stuff in the news about UFOs lately, and I need you to know the U.S. government assures us these are not UFOs. So I feel like that's pretty but buttoned up now, so I'm just going to move on. I said I could do one dumb joke, and that was it, so we're, we're good for the rest of the time. Don't worry. I want to begin today by reading through the whole of our text today, um, but before I do, I want to give a quick preface about how we're going to approach it. Um, we are approaching uh, the end of Galatians 5 and really getting close to the end of our series in Galatians, and Galatians 5 is probably the most well-known part of Galatians because in it contains the fruits of the Spirit. Most of us know about the fruits of the Spirit. Many of you even have that memorized. But for our purposes today, what I want to do is actually zoom out. I want to approach this passage from a 30,000 foot view, asking the question, how do we walk in the spirit to receive spiritual fruit? And then on our nine year anniversary, which you should all be at, it's gonna be so great to celebrate what God has done. In a couple weeks, Jason is gonna go in depth into what the fruits of the spirit are. So I'm gonna approach it at a bit of a different angle today. Basically, I'm not gonna to touch the fruits of the spirit at all today, okay? okay? So come with me to Galatians chapter five, verse 16, and let's read this together. But I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If you've been in the church for any amount of time, you will have heard sermons, you will have read books, you will have listened to podcasts about how we as Christ followers are called to be different. But if you're like me, if you look honestly at your life, 
I often wonder, where is the difference? Am I much different than the rest of the world? We're living in a time of such darkness. In many ways, as Christ followers, it should be easy for us to be different. Easier. But I often feel like I'm not much different. Are we being salt? Are we being light? Are we living lives that cause those who are walking in darkness to look at our lives and ask, what does she have that I don't? What does he do that I'm not doing? What are the differences? Where is the fruit in the Apostle Paul language, his language today? Last week, Scott started in chapter five, and this is the first verse he read. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, stand firm therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So with all of this, I read that verse and I ask myself, am I free? Are we free? And so today I want to deal with a major biblical gospel reality that the text before us brings out. That to walk in freedom is to walk in the Spirit. To walk in freedom is to walk in the Spirit. You guys with me today? Yes. There we go. Okay, we can give me some head nods if you're with me. Every week. You can't do this, but you can do this. Okay, I'll allow that. At the moment of conversion, we receive the Holy Spirit. If we are in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit, and Jesus makes his dwelling in you and I. We are the new temple. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And in Galatians, through this book, Paul has been trying to bring the churches of Galatia back to their new reality in the gospel. And that reality is this. When you are in Jesus, you are free. If you are in Jesus, you are free. You are free from your sin. And you are free also from the moral demand of perfection in the Old Testament law. That's what we've been working through. But it gets better than that. We are not only free from our sin and from the law, we are now free to live a life of truth goodness, and beauty as we walk with Jesus. Amen? But the journey, the joy, and the struggle of the Christian life is this, learning to live out that reality. It is a struggle. It is hard work. As anyone in here who's been walking with Jesus for a while, they will tell you it is a struggle. So how do we walk in freedom? How do we walk in love? How do we live lives that bear spiritual fruits that are actually different? We walk in the Spirit. We must walk in the Spirit. So if walking in freedom and in love requires walking in the Spirit, then we have to ask the question, how? How do we walk in the Spirit? And that's the question I want to spend time answering today. But before we can go any further, we have to understand a couple terms Paul is using in our text today. Flesh and spirit. Let me reread for you verses 16 and 17 if you're following along. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, Paul is assuming a meta-biblical spiritual reality as he writes these words. The forces of God, the spirit of God, cannot coexist with the spirit of flesh, evil, and sin. They are opposed to each other. They cannot be in the same place with each other. Likewise, in our hearts, in you and in me, the spirit of the living God cannot coexist with your sin, your flesh, or with Satan. So let me give you some definitions today. The flesh. The flesh is life without God. The flesh is our animalistic, disordered desires bent towards self and self-gratification. The spirit is God's empowering presence in you and in me. 
if I could just strip these definitions down a little bit further for you, I want you to be able to leave here today having a grasp on this so God can use you to play out this reality wherever you go in your life. The flesh leads to destruction, the spirit leads to life. The flesh leads to destruction, the spirit leads to life. And here lies our great problem as Jesus followers. The way we may want to live a life for God, we may want to walk in his way, we may want his fruit, but our flesh is still in conflict with the spirit, isn't it? Maybe that's just me. Is that just me this morning? Okay. You guys are making me feel bad. I guess it is just me. Paul's language is this. We end up doing things we don't want to do. Now, one of the most beautiful realities of the Christian faith is this, that our desires are not wrong. Our desires are given to us by God as he has created us as human beings. Our desires for sex, food, our ambitions for work, pleasure, rest, even desire for physical things. We live in bodies created by God, in a world created by God, with desires that were created by God, and in the beginning, it was all very good. It was good, it was not a mistake. Your body, your desires are not a mistake, but because of sin, our desires are messed up. Our desires are not what they should be or they're out of order. Does that make sense? And this is what Paul means when he says that the flesh keeps us from doing the things we want to do. In Jesus, we have a new heart, we have a new desire, and we have new wants. But the flesh keeps us from doing the things we now, in Christ, want to do. And this is what we, we need to understand about desire today. Sometimes our deepest desires are not our strongest desires. Sometimes our deepest desires are not our strongest desires. If I polled the room today, and this, was, this would be awkward, I won't really do this, but watch out. If I polled the room today and asked you, do you want to be in good physical shape? 99% of you would say yes. 1% of you would be trolling me for asking you, but the rest of you would say yes. Collectively, so, so collectively, our deepest desire is to be in good physical shape, to take care of our bodies, to exercise, to maintain a healthy weight, and be healthy people. We're all on the same page with the same desire. Interesting. But for most of us, that is not our strongest desire. Anyone else? That is not my strongest desire. The desire to be healthy is deep and it's real, but it is not yet stronger than my desire for fast food, for soda, for donuts, for overeating, or sleeping in instead of working out. It's just me? Anyone else? Okay. This is just one example of what it means when Paul says that we end up doing what we don't want to do. This is the flesh at war with the spirit. We are doing what we don't want to do. Every person in here who calls Jesus Lord wants the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We want to walk in freedom, yet we are at war in our hearts and desires to do what we want to do. We're fighting for freedom and we're fighting for spiritual, spiritual freedom in our hearts. And this is what Paul has for us today, okay? The way to freedom the way to the fruits, the way to be different are in two things. The first is crucifying the flesh and the second is walking in the spirit. Let's talk first about crucifying the flesh. Verse 24, Paul says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So I wanna share a few thoughts today about how we crucify the flesh. The first is this, when we encounter sin in our lives, don't move on, move deeper. Don't move on, move deeper. My wife 
leaves the house when I set up Ikea furniture. <laughs> Anyone else? When we go to Ikea and we come home with a bookshelf, we just have an understanding that my wife is going to take the kids for a walk, daddy's going to put the Ikea furniture together, kids. Because I have had this tendency since I was a kid that has manifested in different ways where when I encounter problems in a project specifically with Ikea furniture, <laughs> and when those projects don't go my way, I find myself yelling, cursing, and screaming at the inanimate objects sitting before me as if that helps. Anyone else? Is that just me? I'm just being real real with you today. Okay, I got some hands up. There we go. And I know it's wrong. It's a trivial little thing, but I know it's wrong. There's a part of me that feels, if I'm honest with you, almost unable to control myself in those moments. Like it nearly happens to me. And I don't mean to say that to give into victim mentality. I'm completely responsible for my heart and my sin before God and my family, right? But if I'm honest with you, often in those moments, when I'm trying to step into my role as a man, as a father, I'm often surprised by my anger. And can I tell you honestly, that's not the man I want to be. It's a small thing I'm sharing with you today, but it's not what my, I want my kids growing up seeing dad doing. I don't want my kids growing up having to leave the house when we come home from Ikea every time, right? I want my kids to grow up seeing dad when he encounters frustration and challenge to not lower himself to his base feelings, but rise above and move through challenges. That's what I want my kids to see in me. So instead of telling myself, which I've done for so many years, being angry is bad, stop and move on. Instead of moving on, I've decided to, a few years ago, go a bit deeper. I started to ask God, why? God, why do I do this? What is in me that is coming out in these moments? And he slowly revealed to me this, I'm angry in these moments because as a man, as a husband, as a father, I feel alone. One of the deep truths about masculinity that we do not understand in our modern culture is that masculinity is something that is handed down from men to boys. It is bestowed. And there are many spaces and places, if I'm honest with you, in my life as a man where I feel completely alone. I'm figuring this out as I go. I've had no one to show me. Let's go. And let me preface today, I have a great relationship with my father. I deeply love my dad. But as I began to move deeper into this part of me, God started to say, you don't just have an anger problem. You have a masculinity problem. You don't just have an anger problem, you have a faith problem, an identity problem. I don't just need to work on my anger, I need to practice the presence of God. God who is the good father, who has made me as a man, who is sitting with me, loving me, even when I crush the Ikea bookshelf. <laughs> He's right there, loving me, even in that moment. Tim Keller says this, we have to ask ourselves not just what we do wrong, but why we do it. To crucify the sinful nature is to say, Lord, my heart thinks that I must have this thing. Otherwise, I have no value. It is a pseudo savior. But to think and feel and live like this is to forget what I mean to you, how you see me in Christ. When you are encountering sin in your life, a stronghold where you feel surprised and out of control, don't move on, move deeper. 
with the Spirit of God with you, ask him, why do I do this? What is going on in me? The next question in crucifying the flesh is this. Is this what I really want? Ask him why, and then ask yourself, is this what I really want? In the Gospel of John, as John the Baptist is building up a hype for this guy named Jesus, Jesus enters the scene, and because the hype has been built, two disciples find him and begin to follow him. And as they follow him, Jesus senses them behind him. He stops, he turns, he looks at them. And in John 1, chapter 1, verse 38, he looks at them in the eyes and he says, what do you want? What do you want? And this is not a moment of triviality. This is Jesus piercing the hearts of these disciples who have no clue what he's about yet, who have just decided to follow him. It's like he's trying to get to their motivation and desire right from the start. Do they want to follow Jesus in this moment in John chapter 1 because they know he's going to lead them to sacrificial love, literally sacrificing their lives to see the kingdom of God breaking into this world? Or maybe they have a different want and they see this man as someone who's going to overthrow the occupying Roman government and be king of the Jews once again. Very different motivations, isn't it? What do you want? And this is what the biblical authors get that we miss in our time. You are what you want. You are what you want. And and follow the screen with me. I'm going to present to you kind of a syllogism that's going to follow, okay? What you want determines what you love. What you love determines what you do. And what you do over the course of a life determines who you are. So if you're following that, you are what you want. You are what you want. James K.A. Smith says this, Our wants and longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behaviors flow. Our wants reverberate from our heart, the epicenter of the human person. The scripture counsels above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Discipleship, we might say, is a way to curate your heart, to be attentive and intentional about what you love. Listen up to this last line. So discipleship is more a matter of hungering and thirsting than of knowing and believing. Let me read that last line again. Discipleship is more a matter of hungering and thirsting than of knowing and believing. So if sin is linked to our disordered desires, and if you are in Jesus, ask yourself, is this what I really want? Remind yourself of your identity. You are a son of the king. You are a daughter of Jesus. You are made to rule and reign with him as his kingdom comes to earth. So with your identity, ask yourself, is this what his son should really want? Is this what his daughter really needs? I'm a big fan of letting people hit rock bottom. (laughs) Here's what I mean. I don't try to push people there. I'm not trying to hurt people or sabotage people to rock bottom. But as a pastor, as a Christian, when I sense in an individual no longing, no desperation, no desire for change in the conversation, rock bottom is often the only teacher that will change desire. Those of us who have found God at rock bottom know exactly what I mean. When people hit their rock bottom, they begin for the first time in their hearts, in authenticity, to say, this is not what I really want. This is not what I really want. It's that prodigal son moment where we lift our head up from the pig trough and we say, this isn't what I really want 
my father's house was better. And some of you, I want to identify this today. Some of you are right there in this room today. You've come through our doors because you're there at rock bottom. I want to say a couple things to you. Welcome to the club. The God of the universe is running out to meet you in that space. He has met many of us there and brought us home to life with him. Don't give in to distraction. See through the moment what he is trying to do in your heart and soul today. So this is the first part of learning to crucify the flesh. When we're facing sin, we choose not to move on, but to move deeper. We ask why. We ask ourselves, is this what I really want? We choose to sit in silence, not on Netflix, but in silence with the Father and ask him why. We let him reveal the roots of our desires, and then once those are revealed, he can begin to change our desires. The second way we crucify the flesh, and this one's really fun, is confession. That was a joke. It's not fun. <laughs> the second way we crucify the flesh is to practice confession. Just like fasting, like prayer, like reading scripture, confession is a practice, a repetitive act that leads us to God and leads us to freedom. Now, if you know a bit about church history, Martin Luther and the Reformers were not big fans of confession. Some of their biggest fights in the Reformation in the Catholic Church had to do with confession because confession back then in the Catholic Church had become, ironically, a private therapeutic reality between a priest and a normal person. The architecture of the room in which you confess has a veil for the face and you are sitting literally in darkness. And this led to tons of abuse in the church. But it was the, it was the abuse of confession that the reformers were fighting, not the proper use of confession. And that is so important for us today. James 5.16 says this, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, Sin demands to have a man all by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him. Sin wants to remain unknown. It shuns the light in the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. In the darkness of the unexpressed. My friends, the fruits of the flesh grow in darkness. The fruits of God's spirit grow in the light. Confession is moving repentance into the realm of community. It's moving repentance from the private life to being seen by someone else. Confession is engaging in spiritual warfare for your soul. Confession is the catalyst that moves forgiveness to freedom. And some of you today are dealing with repetitive sin or hidden sin, and you've been asking for God to forgive you, which he will do. You're experiencing forgiveness, but you have not yet experienced freedom. This may be why. God will always forgive our sin, but some sin, especially habitual sin, requires that we take the next step. Drag your sin into the light of community. Confession isn't being caught, regardless of what the enemy is saying to you. Confession isn't being found out. Confession is freedom. It is release. It is walking in the light. It is painful, but it is life. Confession is where we oppose the flesh in us. So really practically today, don't just do this with anyone off the street or anyone even here. 
Find someone who you have relational capital with, who you are willing to let into the inner part of who you are. Preferably someone who is older than you and more mature in their faith than you. And do this. Be released today. The older saints in our church are like, oh no, God, here we go. <laughs> do this. It is worth it. To crucify the flesh, we must commit not to just move on, but to move deeper. To ask why instead of simply telling ourselves to stop. It's to step into victory in the light of confession here in community. But in our text today, Paul is assuming the crucifixion of the flesh. What he's commanding is that we walk in the spirit. He's assuming the crucifixion of the flesh as Christians, and he is commanding us to walk in the spirit. The fruits of the spirit, this whole section I read to you earlier, is sandwiched between two commands. Verse 16, Paul says, but I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Then he closes this train of thought by saying, if we live by the spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This walking with the Spirit stuff, I think, is really important to Paul. So what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What does it mean to keep in step? Really simply, guys, trajectory and consistency. Trajectory and consistency. F.F. Bruce says this about the Spirit. Thus, for Paul, life in the Spirit begins at conversion with the gift of the Spirit, continues as it is sustained by that same spirit and waits for the final establishment of God's kingdom in the same spirit. What is he saying here? The work of the spirit of God in the believer's life is a paradox. The spirit in us is a free gift we have not earned given to us by God. Amen? Amen. Yet, the spirit in us is what's moving us to effort and action in our faith. The gift in us that's freely given always leads to fruit and action on our part. It's a dance. One of the quotes that has changed my life in walking with Jesus is from Dallas Willard. He says, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude Effort is an action. We have been given everything by the grace of Jesus. Yet when we receive that grace, it produces in us unrelenting work and effort to live out that grace. So why does Paul make such a big deal about walking in the Spirit? It's because of this. Roots come before fruits. Roots come before fruits. Spiritual roots come before spiritual fruits. Roots come before fruits and roots sustain fruit. So what does it mean to walk in the spirit? Really simply, guys, to walk in the spirit is to be with God. It's to be with the Father. Before fruits, we establish roots by being with God. Walking with God in daily, intimate, hidden devotion. Roots go deep. Roots take time. At times you can't see when a root is growing because they're hidden. Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. Notice the roots of the tree are at the river's space. It's living water constantly giving life to the tree. It's simply being with God. Jesus' life, his pattern of ministry was to come to a town, heal the sick, cast out the demonic, 
and preach a message about the kingdom of God. And the moment he began building a following and a crowd, he starts to get that influencer status and the disciples are getting hyped and the next moment, where's Jesus? Where is he? He's gone. He's He's with the Father. He's with the Father. He doesn't care about the hype. He doesn't care about the crowd. He cares about being with the Father. The hidden life of Jesus was his source of public power. The hidden life of Jesus with the Father was his source of public power. To walk with Jesus is to be with the Father. Listen to Jesus' words as this biblical analogy keeps going. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. This is an all or nothing statement from Jesus. Kind of legalistic, isn't it, Jesus? That's a joke. It's all or nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. My friends, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God is in you and me. The person of the Holy Spirit is real. And the God of the universe wants to spend time with you and me. He asks that we would abide in him. So if we start to get this, reading our Bibles, prayer, fasting, silence, solitude, morning, quiet time, evening, devotional time, when we start to get that God wants to be in us so we could be filled, the disciplines of our faith move from loose moral obligation to a place of joy-giving I must have this to live. I must have this to be okay. I must have him. The spiritual disciplines, the end of the spiritual disciplines are to be with God. They're not to make you good. They're not to do anything else other than just to be with God. The rest of it flows from being with him. I have been following nonstop what is happening right now at Asbury University. Um, A few weeks ago, at a worship chapel, some students began playing worship at the chapel at Asbury University, and they left, and they came back, sensing the Spirit of God asking them to keep playing. And they have been worshiping, and the crowd has been growing, ever since, and we're approaching now the three-week mark. Three weeks of nonstop worshiping. That's right. That's let's go, right? That's what I said. We're approaching three weeks now. And I wanted to just read some lines from people who have been there, who have posted on their social media, and just think about what we've been talking about in our text today. Because I know as we hear stuff like that, Our cynicism can creep up. We can ask, is this real? Is this legitimate? Is this hype? So let me just read a few lines about what I think is happening there. This is acoustic guitars, pianos, and non-charismatic speakers. This is as unsensationalized as it could be. There was such an unbelievable freedom to worship Jesus. The entire atmosphere was utter freedom. You felt like you were at the throne in heaven and everyone was around him. God was in the midst. It was like a wave of the spirit that hit certain people at different times. The altar has been full, nonstop with people weeping and worshiping at it too. The spirit of God was making the altar call. When Christ is in the midst, you couldn't stay comfortable if there was any sin in your life. There was worship, prayer, repentance, public confession, and testimonies. He doesn't need any fancy things or big name preachers. God was there to get all the glory. So 
So as we close, I wanna just remind you of a reality that you now live in if you're walking in Christ. The spirit of the living God, the same spirit that hovered over the waters in the beginning, the spirit that breathes life into our nostrils, the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the spirit that comes in flame and wind, and the spirit that speaks the sound of silence, the same spirit outpouring his love, power, and presence at Asbury University, that spirit is in you in me. So walk in the spirit. Let your hidden life with the Father produce a power in you you have not yet known. Choose every day to walk with him, my friends. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And here's the crux of what you need to hear today. When we walk in the spirit, we're not walking with the spirit to receive the blessings from God or even the fruit from God. When we walk in the spirit, we are walking to be with God. That is the point. That is the goal. There can be no other motivation. There's nothing better. Amen. He is worthy of it all, my friends. He is worthy of it all, and from him flows all the goodness, the secondary things, all the fruit, all the things. Let me pray for us today, okay? <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit. You are real. God, sometimes in my life, my faith becomes more of a system of belief rather than relationship with you. So Holy Spirit, come into our gathering. We say come in the midst of revival and excitement happening in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky. And we also say come in the midst of terror and death in Syria and Turkey. And your children just keep living in the tension and we say, come Holy Spirit. Fire and wind, do it again, come. Jesus, I wanna ask that you would move here today. Every week we, we strive for excellence in our teaching, in our worship, in our service, not so we can have an excellent service, so we can facilitate the living God speaking and meeting us. That's why we're here. So Holy Spirit, come. Come into lives today, people who are not walking with you, who don't know you, but feel like you have been drawing them here. Break down walls today. Reveal sin today and bring people into the light in life today. And for some of us who have been walking with you for a long time, where the faith that we once knew that burned hot in our hearts has grown stale and cold, Breathe new life into our spirits, Jesus. Would you awaken our church to the reality that you are real and that you are on the move and that we can join you? Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name, amen.